All right, this is my Amalia Ben of Isaac Wireless. This is probably like one of my new favorite commanders from the new Ixlan set. So let's get straight into it. She got Ward 3, or Ward Pay 3 Life. So that means they need to pay 3 Life to target her with stuff. If not, they uh, the spell gets countered and it fizzles. Whenever you gain life, she explores. Then destroy all other creatures if its power is exactly 20. So it needs to become... 20 with the the explore effect so like if you made it like 19 power and then you explored and then it became 20 it would do the effect so you can't just make her like oh i'm just gonna make her 20 power and then she's gonna board wipe all the other creatures that doesn't work so yeah this card's strong explore means that you look at the top card of your deck and if it's a non-land you can keep it there or put it in the graveyard, and then you put a 1-1 one -one counter on the creature that explored. If it's a land, you put it into your hand. Okay, back to the cards, though. As Johnny's welcome, uh, whenever a creature enters battlefield under your control, you gain one life. Authority of the councils, whenever creatures, creatures your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped. Whenever they enter the battlefield, you gain one life. That card's just unfair. You play authority of the councils just to make your deck better. This is a strong deck, by the way. This is definitely a strong deck. Fragment Reality, one mana hits artifacts non-token creatures and non-token enchantments and non-token artifacts it's all non-tokens and then when it removes them you dig up a cre your opponent digs up a creature with lesser mana value and it enters the battlefield tap the card's just unfair fragment reality is just unfair <sighs> soul warden whenever a creature enters the battlefield under anybody's control you gain one life speaker of the heavens is a 1-1 one, one with lifelink and vigilance and then when you you can tap him and make an angel as long as you have seven more life than your starting life total which is 32 in this mode swords plowshares exile target creature it's control against life equal to its power best removal well probably ra fragment reality is the best removal swords is probably the second best creature removal dawnbringer cleric when it enters battlefield choose one cure wounds two life destroy target enchantment or it can uh gentle repost it can um exile target card from a graveyard johnny's pride point is whenever you gain life put a 1-1 counter on him cool dawn of hope whenever you gain life you may pay two if you do draw a card and then you can create a 1-1 white soldier creature token with lifelink so it can trigger itself daxos blessed by his son toughness is equal to your devotion to white which means you count all the mana pips of white on the on your board and that's his toughness whenever another creature you control enters the battlefield or perishes dies i don't like to use that word remember uh you gain one life gadia font of hope uh she can tap for mana to cast angels and then angels enter with a one one counter for each other angel that you already have and she's got flying and vigilance lone wider i was thinking about trying this in historic because this card actually seems kind of strong has first strike life link it says at the beginning of the end step if you gain three or more life this turn transform lone wider and then it becomes a first strike trample life link that's a four four on turn two that's pretty strong you can play it on like turn two turn three even cast something like revitalize and just flip it at the end of the turn it's a bit slow but i mean that's pretty strong honestly voice of the blast as a two two whenever you gain life put a one one counter on voice of the blast as long as voice of the blast has four or more one one counters on it it has flying and vigilance as long as it has 10 or more it gains indestructible so this card is just a straight up win condition one of the best win conditions in life gain dex period blood artist whenever blood artist another creature you control perishes or anybody controls excuse me perishes target opponent loses one life you gain one life so it drains from one whenever one or more other creatures you control perish each opponent loses two life and you gain two life this ability only triggers once per turn yeah so ron's pretty cool he can only activate once per turn so keep that in mind but he does two like basically a lot of these effects are one damage he does two well he doesn't do damage he drains but <laughs> cleric life bond whenever another cleric enters battlefield control you gain one life whenever you gain life for the first time each turn you put a 1-1 counter on him this card's good he'd be absolutely insane if he could put more than one counter on himself per turn but if he could he'd probably be a little bit unfair honestly because he does everything by himself cruel celebrant whenever a cruel celebrant 
or another creature or planeswalker you control perishes. Each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. This is the best card of that type of effect. The dies and perishes effect. She's literally the best card for it as Cruel Celebrant. Death Touch. An Ellis Core Sadistic Pilgrim. Death Touch. Whenever another creature... Could, you, whenever another creature enters a battlefield under your control, you gain one life. Whenever another creature you control perishes, each opponent loses one life. This card is pretty cool. You, you've been see, you might see her a little bit on ladder. She's a pretty cool uncommon commander that's actually like kind of surprisingly strong. There's another one in Ixalan. I'm going to build him up. He's a Selesnya guy. Stay tuned for that one. I'll, I'll reveal him later. Hell yeah, Sun Crown, indestructible. As long as your devotion to white is less than seven, or five, excuse me, He's not a creature. Whenever you gain life, you can put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature or enchantment you control, and he can give lifelink to another creature for two mana, one white and one. Invoke the Divine. Uh, pop target artifact and enchantment. You gain four life. Four life's kind of a bit, so. Uh, Linden the Steadfast Queen has Vigilance. Whenever a white creature you control attacks, you gain one life. She's pretty good. She's a bit hard to cast, though, because she has three white. Lulu, Forgotten Hollyphant, Flying, Specialized. When she enters the battlefield, she can give a non-flyer perpetual flying. So I was kind of thinking about that with the commander. And then when she specializes, she gains life based upon flyers. Her white effect is you gain twice as much life as other flyers that you have. So if you have like three flyers, you gain four life because you don't count her. And then the black one is like a drain effect. Path of Bravery, as long as your life total is greater than or equal to your starting life total, creatures you control get 1-1. One, one. Whenever one or more creatures you control attack, you gain life equal to the number of attacking creatures. This card's pretty good. I mean, it's it's good for it because it's another life gain trigger. Like with life gain decks, you want to have your life gain stagger, like stagger your triggers. You want to have them like gain life in different increments of time. Like, you play a creature, it gets all the ETB life gain, and then you swing and it sees another life gain trigger. You know what I mean? That's why, that's how you want to play your life gain decks. Trust me, I've been playing life gain for four years now. I know how to play a life gain deck. Resplendent Angel has flying. At the beginning of your end step, if you gain five or more life this turn, you create a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying and vigilance, so a Ceres Angel. And then you can pay six. Until end of turn, she gains 2-2 two, two and gains lifelink, so she can activate herself. Uh, Sarah's Angel is still a good card, honestly. Maybe not like the card itself, but when you start getting angel tokens like that for pretty much free for just playing the game, yeah, they're still pretty pretty dang good. Uh, Righteous Valkyrie is flying. Whenever another angel or cleric enters battlefield in your control, you gain life equal to that creature's toughness, and then when you have seven more life than your starting life total, each creature you control gains two attack and two defense. He's a double, the uh, Resplendent Angel, she's a double Anthem. She's nuts. Like, that's a straight-up win condition right there. Bastion of Remembrance gives you a guy, a 1-1 one, one human, and then whenever another creature you control, or whenever creatures you control perish, you drain your opponent for one each. For each creature for one. Black Market Connections, you can pay one life, get a treasure. Pay two life, draw a card. Pay three life, get a 3-2 shapeshifter, so it's every single creature type. Uh, this card is good when you can gain a lot of life. When you can piano every the abilities, you know, pick all three of them. That's what I'm talking about when I say piano. Or pick most of them more often than not. That's when that card's good. Honestly, I mean, it's just a good card anyways. You can even just get the one treasure token for one life. You just want to gain a little bit of life with it because it's really exceptional when you can piano it every turn. Uh, Bloodthirsty Aerialist has flying, and then whenever you gain life, you put a 1-1 counter on her. She's pretty simple. Graveyard Trespasser, when it enters battlefield or attacks, you can exile a card from a graveyard. If it's a creature, you gain one life, and your opponent loses one life. And then when it turns into Graveyard Glutton, you do you exile two cards at a time. Gumdrop Poisoner has Tempt with Treats, create a food token. Lifelink, when Gumdrop Poisoner enters the battlefield or attacks, or, um, yeah, enters the battlefield, target creature gains minus X, minus X until end of turn, where X is the amount of life you gain that turn. For Axian Arena, you lose one life and draw an additional card at your upkeeps. It's a bit not exactly right when you draw, but it's like a, just a slightly bit different timing. Uh, Kimball Council, 
of whatever. He, uh, whenever your opponents cast non-creature spells, the, he drains them for two. So you gain two, they lose two. Markov Purifier, Lifelink. At the beginning of your end step, if you gain life this turn, you may pay two if you do draw a card. That card's good. It's like uh, the Dawn of Hope on a body. So he's actually really good. A Johnny Adversary, Tyrant. Plus one, put two 1-1 one, one counters on one of each creature. You have to, you, you target two creatures. You don't have to target uh, up to two creatures, but you can't put two 1-1 one, one counters on one creature. It has to be one, in, one on each creature. His minus two, he brings back creatures with mana value two or less from your graveyard straight to the battlefield. His minus seven is at the beginning of your end step. You create three 1-1 one, one cats with lifelink. Uh, this card is just excellent. He's a bit slow, but he, he is a really excellent planeswalker, especially for an Ajani. Ajani Strength of the Pride uh, is plus one. You gain life equal to the number of creatures and planeswalkers that you can co control at the time you activate it. So it's like a big chunky life gain. Uh, he makes Ajani's Pride Mates tokens, which are two twos that whenever you gain life, they, you put a one one counter on them. And then his minus zero is actually minus zero. If you have 15 more life than your starting life total you exile all your opponents creatures and planeswalk are creatures and artifacts and him archangel elspeth creates a one one white soldier creature token with lifelink uh her minus two put two one one counters on target creature it gains flying it becomes an angel her minus six return all non-land permanent cards with mana value three or less from your bat our graveyard to the battlefield all at the same time she's she's just a big chunky win condition in a lot of these life gain piles because most of their like core cards are all three mana or less. Elspeth's son's nemesis. Her minus one, minus note that this planeswalker has no pluses. So she's bent to like eventually perish. Her minus one is actually quite strong. Up to two target creatures you control gain two attack and one defense until end of turn. Uh, her minus two, you create two one one white humans creature token or soldier human soldier creature tokens. Ugh. Uh, Minus three, you gain five life. It's pretty simple. The gain five life is pretty nice because there's a lot of cards that call for that much life to be gained at one time, especially like Resplendent Angel. She's excellent to pair with that. Uh, the Wandering Emperor has flash, and as long as you played it with its flash effect, like during your opponent's turn, you can activate one of her loyalty abilities as though she was an instant speed. You can only do that the one time, though. Uh, she can make a samurai, the 2-2 two -two with vigilance. She can uh, give something a 1-1 one -one counter in first strike, or she can exile target tap creature and you gain two life. Consuming Oni has flying menace at the beginning of your end step. You curse a card in your hand to where it perpetually costs three more life to cast. Like when you cast it, you automatically lose three life. Like it goes on the stack or whatever, but. Revenge of the Ravens. Whenever a creature attacks you or a planeswalker you control, that creature's controller loses one life and you gain one life, so you drain, and that's for each creature. So that, that can be pretty crazy against like big go wide strategies. Revenge of Ravens can literally stop them from uh, attacking. Shieldred, the Apocalypse, you've seen it before, has Death Touch, four or five. Whenever you draw a card, you gain two life. Whenever your opponents draw cards, they lose two life. Twilight Prophet has Flying and Ascend. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you have the city's blessing, you reveal the top card of your opponent or your library and your opponent gets drained for that card's mana value and you place it into your hand. So she's a little bit of card acceleration. She's a really cool mythic rare. She's a mythic rare, but she's cool. She's old. Cleansing Nova, you've seen that in every list that I play that's white. Uh, you either pop all creatures or pop all enchantments and artifacts. You choose one or the other, but not both. Crested Sun Mirror, other horses you control have indestructible. When, then whenever you gain life, you make a 5-5 five, five white horse at the end of your turn. So it only triggers once per turn. Lyra Dawnbringer is flying first strike and lifelink. Other angels you control have 1-1 one, one and have, and have lifelink. We have Clackbridge Troll, has trample and haste. When he enters the battlefield, you give your opponent three zero one one white goat creature tokens. At the beginning of combat on your turn, any opponent may sacrifice a creature. If a player does, you tap Clackbridge Troll, gain three life and draw a card. So this guy is kind of like gives this like, cause he's really big and strong. He's an eight, eight for five mana that has trample and haste. Like that's pretty nuts, honestly. So they like, they can pay off the troll. 
Witch of the Moors, this card's insane. It has Death Touch. At the beginning of your end step, if you gain life this turn, each opponent sacrifices a creature, and you return up to one target creature from your graveyard to your hand. That that just, like, neg two for your opponent, where they lose one thing and you gain back one thing. This card's absolutely mental, honestly. This card's very strong. You should get it for free just by starting the game. I know you get at least one of them for free. Kaya the Inexorable. You uh, put a ghost form counter on up to one target creature. It gains when this creature is per or perishes or is put into exile. Return it to its owner's hand and create a 1-1 one -one white spirit creature token with flying. You can exile target non-land permanent. And then you get an emblem at the beginning of your upkeep. You may cast a legendary spell from your hand, your graveyard, or face up among exiled cards you control. This card's nuts. Lisa, Fallen Archangel has Flying Lifelink. Whenever a non-creature, nor a non-token creature you control perishes, you may return that card to your hand at the beginning of that turn's end cycle, and that, that turn's end step. And then whenever your opponent's creatures perish, they get exiled instead. Farewell is choose one or more, exile all creatures, enchantments, artifacts, or uh, graveyards. So you can pick all four or pick three of them or whatever. Uh, Steel Seraph, this card's actually pretty bad, but it's got prototype, that's what saves it. Uh, you can pay it as a you can play it as a three mana three three or a six mana five four, and then at the beginning of combat on your turn you pick a creature and it can gain either lifelink, flying, or industry or vigilance. Uh, Valkyrie Harbinger is basically a resplendent angel, except you only need to gain four life and it does everything by itself. Uh, Noxious Gearhawk has Menace. When he enters the battlefield, you can pop a creature, and if you do, you gain life equal to its toughness. Angel of the Dire Hour has Flash and Flying. When it enters the battlefield, if you cast it from your hand, exile all attacking creatures. So this card is basically like Settle the Records, except it's, like, not bad. Amira's Call. Create two four four white angels... Angel warrior creature tokens with flying non-angel creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn And then it's a tapped white source unless you pay three Sarah's emissary has flying when it enters the battlefield you choose a card super type you and creatures you control gain protection from that cards super type super type being creature land planeswalker instant sorcery and battle those are the ones you could pick an artifact uh, Virtue of Persistence, once we get to it. But yeah, so this is Virtue of Persistence. Target creature you gain, or gets minus three, minus three until end of turn, you gain two life. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, you put a target creature from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. Card's just excellent, honestly. It's just a big win condition, and it's good because it's a removal early, too, so it's not just sitting dead in your hand. Uh, Kaya Intangible Slayer has Hexproof. Each opponent loses three life, and you gain three life per zero as you draw two cards, and your opponent may scry one. Her minus three is Exile Target Creature or Enchantment, and then you make a copy of it on your side of the board, except it's a 1-1 one -one Spirit. Avacyn Angel of Hope has Indestructible Flying... And it, it has vigilance, and it ga gives all other permanents you control indestructible. Uh, Heliod's intervention: you choose one, pop target X artifacts and/or enchantments, or target player gains twice X life. The card's just great. Agadim's Awakening is a lot like Amiria's Call, where it's a tap black source, where you can pay three life and has comes into play untapped, or otherwise it comes into play tapped, or you pay three black and then X. Whatever X is, you pick creatures with mana values in that order. Like, say you play, like, X equals 5. It'd be, like, a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You could bring all those back from the graveyard straight to the battlefield. And then it was mana base. We're up against High Flyer, which, fun fact, a High Flyer in Magic is a flying creature that can't block creatures that are non-flyers. That's what a High Flyer is. Uh, they're playing Hidetsu and Kyari. That's literally my favorite Demir can commander in the entire game. I apologize for not putting the timestamp in this video. And I couldn't tell you it because I forgot. Alright, Hidetsu and Kyari. I freaking love this card. Whenever you play him, it brainstorms. So you draw three cards, then put two cards from your hand on the top of your library in any order. Then whenever he perishes, 
you reveal the top card of your library. Your opponent loses life equal to its mana cost. If it's an instant or a sorcery, you can cast it for free. You'll definitely see me play this guy plenty of times. Because I literally played this guy for probably about three months straight. Like when he came out. Like once I discovered this commander existed, I built him up. I brewed him. I'm like, screw it. Let me try this guy. He looks cool. Played him for three months straight. I, I adore this commander. You'll definitely see more of this on the channel. Understand that he is literally my favorite Demir commander in the entirety of Magic Arena by a, by a country mile. I freaking love this card. He's strong enough to be a good card, but not. he's not absurd because there's a lot of plays, ways to play around him. Anyways, I play a Lone Rider here. That's the one one with fly, or it's got first strike in a life link and then when you gain three or more life at the end step it transforms into a first strike trample life link so i'll definitely be trying that to store it because that seems pretty good honestly if you can like kind of consistently get that turn that into a four four yeah that can that can bring some pain pretty early we go ahead and play bastion of remembrance here we get create our human we swing gain one they lose one say go it's their turn. They got a dinosaur head because they are all that is dino. All we know is dino. All we know is dino. All I am is dino. Have you seen my dino? It's kind of outside. They play Dr Dread Fugue here. This uh, target player reveals their hand. You choose a non land card with it. With mana value two or less, that player discards that card. Cleave means you ignore the uh, text in brackets. The card, Dread Feud is actually a really cool budget option to uh, Thought Seize, especially in Historic, because more often than not, a lot of cards cost two mana value or less. So you can hit a lot of stuff, especially against like Life Gain, Wizards, Mono Red. Those are just three examples that it pretty much hits like 90% of their deck anyways. So if you need thought seizes, which you probably should eventually get, uh, you can definitely use Dread Fugue and not feel bad about it. Honestly, it'll hit a lot of stuff. And in and, and, uh, certain lists, you're going to uh, be able to clear it or cleave it eventually, and then it just hits anything. So, Because it's a cherry pick discard. Remember, we went over what a cherry pick discard is. We go ahead and play our Johnny Strengths of the Pride here. Make the Johnny's Pride mate say go. Okay, they play Hidetsu and Kaiara here and they brainstorm. Remember, brainstorm is when they draw three, look at the, the three that they drew take two from their hand put it back on the top of their deck when you hear a brainstorm effect because there's the card that it, they played first turn is called brainstorm that's the original card of that effect and Hidetsu and Kaiori brainstorms and Cavalier of Gales is another example of a card that brainstorms when it comes into play there's a few cards that do duress it's a cherry pick discard except you can only hit nine creatures so duress is also a good one too the rest can pretty much hit anything. Here's what I'm talking about with Hidetsu and Kaiari, how easy it is to play around, is you can just exile it. There's one way to play around it. You can counterspell it. Like, there's a lot of things you can do to um, deal with it. Because I played the commander a lot. So it definitely, you'll see a, a heck of a lot more lists with uh, my Hidetsu and Kaiari. Like, I freaking love that card, honestly. I really do. I think it's fantastic. I think you should play it in paper. I think if anybody plays you, you can make the deck reasonably as strong as you want it to be. Like, it's it's a flexible commander, too. That's what I like about it. Because it's not super crazy by itself, honestly. You can break it, though. Definitely. I'll show you some, some ways to break that commander wide open. They play the Iron Craig here. It's like Mind Stone. It's a mana rock. Except when you play a Legendary, you can turn it into a 3-3 equip. It gives 3-3, three, three, but it, it cancels out the uh, Legendary's abilities. And it, beca it stops becoming a Mana Rock, too. Once you pull the sword out of the Iron Crag, you know, because it's, uh, um, it's, it's about the tail of uh, Excalibur. Because the, the stone 
that the sword Excalibur sits in is called the Iron Craig. That's why it's called that. So that's a fun fact for you. We go ahead and play Revenge of Ravens here. We go ahead and gain some life. When we have gain life, we put a 1-1 one -one counter on this. This video is in 480p. I am trying this out because when I uh, do full screen on my older videos, it cuts off like the half of the video. So you can't see my cards. You can't see most of my avatar. And you can't see my opponent's cards, their hand, or like any of their avatar. You can see everything on the board just fine. But you can't see current cards in hand. Unless it's literally like right in the middle of the screen. So. They play Hidden Dex doing Kyrie again. The Iron Craig contemplates getting pulled from the sword. They pull it. Everflame Heroes Legacy. They're thinking. They swing. We gain one. They lose one. We have to block here with a uh, blood artist. Drain them. Drain them. Counter. Drain. Counter. Say go. We're going to say good game here. Because we just exile their creatures and swing. Because his... his uh, Ability is zero, but you exile them after you use it. So, and they concede. So good game. Cause we had lethal on board anyways. All right. We're up against undead saint. We're up against, uh, like Grella, the magpie. She can, uh, exile creatures from both sides of the board. And then when the creature she exiles returns like from your side, it gets one, two one one counters. So she's like a bounce house ETB commander. Remember a bounce house deck in, in my opinion, or not of my opinion, excuse me, my definition. A bounce house deck is we have ETBs and we're kind of trying to abuse them. We want to use them more than once. So it's called a bounce house. Like you jump up and down, woo, in the bounce house. You're up in the air, in the hand, drop back down on the battlefield. Jump back up in the hand or wherever and come back down and, you know, enter the battlefield. It's bounce house. <coughs> so we play Daxo, Daxos Blessed by the Sun. He's a 2-2 two -two because he gives two mana pips for devotion. Remember, the devotion mechanic is you count whatever color mana pips. You see the devotion in white, how I'm hovering my mouse over it. That's the what you count. You count the white black, blue, red, or green mana pips. Because there is no other devotion. Like, they're only devotion to colors. They haven't printed a... I don't... For my knowledge, at least, I don't think there's a card that's devoted to colorless. Which would probably not be that good anyways. There is no devotion to colorless. There is a few Eldrazi that actually call for colorless mana because there are some cards mainly the Eldrazi that you have to spend colorless mana on. Because remember, colorless mana is like the one in that containment priest right there. That's colorless mana. That means you can play any mana color for it or colorless mana for it. And colorless mana is a, like a, it's a gray diamond is what it looks like. You'll see it in a few Eldrazi cards. That's the only cards I can think of off the top of my head that actually call for colorless mana. All right, then they, uh, they play a land and just hold up three lands. So we're thinking that they probably have a counter spell. So we opt to uh, play around it. They're thinking here, potentially counterspelling or removing one of our threats. They're blue and white, so either white's probably got a few instant speed options. You've seen them before, Swords of Plowshares, um, Fragment Reality. We don't have Path to Exile in the game yet. It'll probably come here soon. Path to Exile is like Swords of Plowshares, except they dig out a land. 
Long Road Home. Yeah, because that can like exile things and then return it back if it's yours. We explore twice, make our commander bigger. And we opt to keep the card at the top of the deck because we want it. Send them. Yeah. Long Road Home would attempt to bring it back, but because of Containment Priest, the way Containment Priest works is that if cards were to come back on our side of the field and they weren't cast from our hands, they can't enter the battlefield at all. So Long Road Home becomes a two-mana exile. So, because Long Road Home is one of those, like, bounce house cards where it's like, oh, exile a creature, and then it comes back at the end of the turn. There's usually a few forms of bounce house cards, and there's a few forms of timings. To go over it in general, the timings will be, it blink, it's a flicker effect. What I call a flicker effect is actually a it exiles and leaves and comes right back. Like, it, there's no, no delay. It, it flickers, leaves, comes back. Or there's, like, the travel effects, like Long Road Home, where they leave at the end of the turn or at the end of the next turn, they come back. I call those the travel effects. So there's travel and flicker. Flicker is immediate. Flicker means that in the same instance, they leave and come back as the same card effect, like during the exact same instance, like it leaves and immediately comes back. Sometimes it doesn't even move the stack along when it comes, when it comes back. And they exile their stuff because Containment Priest is like really hyper-powering their flicker slash travel effects because it's not allowing our guys to come back at all because we can't, if a non-token creature would enter the battlefield and if it wasn't cast, exile it instead. So we have to actually cast it. Can aim or priest is a pretty good card. It's a prison card is what you would call those types of cards. A prison card is, it doesn't allow you or your opponent because sometimes you could play like a prison card on yourself but it doesn't allow you or your opponent to do something. Like if it's a card that says, you can't activate artifacts, that's a prison effect. Or like Containment Priest, since we're not casting the creature, it can't enter the battlefield. That's a prison effect. So that's just something, that's a little fun fact of magic. And in other card games might call them prison effects too. But in magic, they're called prison effects. And we play a Phyrexian Arena here as they go. Their turn, they just hold up mana, probably trying to remove our guys. We would swing, but their, their uh, new guy that they played, their OGBL, is a 2 3, so they'll just bounce off our Containment Priest or whatever, or not Containment Priest, our um, Cleric Dude, whatever his name is, whatever he is. But uh, that uh, OG Bug Exquisite Blade, that, that commander is pretty cool. I'll play a deck around her sometime. I played a deck around her once. It was all right. She's, she's a bit underwhelming as a commander because you just have like better options. But I do like the card a lot. I think it's pretty sweet. She like gains two life and scries two when she enters the battlefield. And she has a flicker effect where like once you play your second card, you can uh, target a creature and it flickers it. Because hers, like, they leave and then come back right away. So it's a flicker effect. Yeah, I bring it up right there. Whenever you cast your second spell, each turn X up to one target creature you control, then return that creature straight to the battlefield. Because see, that happens in the same, even in, like, the same paragraph. So that doesn't start another stack or nothing that happens all at the same time so that's i keep drilling this in because that's a ruling thing and that matters containment priest is going to perish here because we're going to gain two life gun drop poisoner give something minus x minus x until end of turn where x is the amount of life that we gain 
as that ability resolves. So see, it originally was gonna give one. It was only gonna minus her by one, one. But because we gained life, and then she saw that, it bumped up to two. You know, so. Sometimes that matters. Usually doesn't, but. That's like a little fun fact for you as well. Because some, some effects, which are pretty much never, they can activate and have a set number for when the effect activates. There's the Lucka that does that, that Lucka that bound to ruin. Like as you activate that effect, even if your creature got removed, he would still deal damage of your highest creature. So let's say you had like a 12-12 and it got removed as you activated that effect. It still does 12 damage because it's as you activate it. So pay attention to that as well. It's pretty simple wording, but just something just in case you're ever like, you know, confused. That's what that, that's how that works. Ojibwa the Exquisite Blade just constantly putting in work. Because her gaining two life and scrying two, that's pretty, I mean, it's potent. We go ahead and take the opportunity to play Crested Sunmare, kind of go over the top. Because he's going to keep uh, pooping out horses. Because he poops horses out. See? Makes a horse pooping. Horses pooping. He gives other horses indestructible. He reads if we ever gain life during our turn at the end step. Or each end, each end step. So that can even be on our opponent's turn. He's a mythic. He's a bit... Oh, they quit. So uh, good game. Woo! All right. This is up against Irish... Ninja. One, two, three. Play an AR of Lockling. I remember this match. We do actually lose this one. So I'll just tell you right now. Spoiler alert. We lose. <laughs> Bitter Blossom. Uh, that, at the start of your turn, it's a lot like a Phyrexian Arena. You lose one life, except you make a 1-1 one, one Black Flying Fairy. The card's amazing. That, that card was really strong back in its time when it came out because it came out on Lorwyn, which is a really old set where only a very few of the cards are actually still viable. Thoughtseize being one of them. Blitter Blossom's another one. And that's the only ones I can really think of off the top of my head. They are first lock lane. They're playing the alternate art. It's whenever she enters battlefield or a black creature enters battlefield, you drain for one. And then she can tap and sacrifice black creatures, and you can draw a card. I'll show you an AR first lock wing with. She's a very strong mono black commander. And mono black is definitely, as far as the colors are concerned, it's definitely one of the better colors to play mono because you get discard, which discard can deal with every card type. Because discard is a lot like counter spells when if if you discard it first before it even hits the board, it's definitely as strong as it gets. And discard's very good against control spells like board wipes and stuff like that. It's actually some of the better ways of dealing with that type of stuff is actually discard. We were thinking about dropping off our uh, Witch of the Moors, but we go ahead and drop off our Gadea instead. Gadea. Gadea! They're thinking about it, like swinging. Come on, just let me bop him one time. I'm gonna bop him so bad. They go ahead and tap their uh, Nyx, Shrines of Nyxlos. That gives you uh, mana equal to your devotion to your color. So it's definitely a land that you, if you play mono, a lot of mono color lists, or even like two color lists, definitely. I I keep forgetting about that card, but you gotta want you're gonna want to snap include that land. It's called Nyx. Shrine of Nyxthos or whatever. Just type in Nyx in the land section. You'll see it. I just popped it up there, but I didn't do keep it for very long. And just type in NYX and you'll find it. For sure. And you'll definitely want to craft it. It's a rare, but you're definitely going to want to craft it, especially if you play Brawl. Like, you're going to... That's definitely a staple card. Because like I said, I do want to keep your guys' decks pretty strong that watches watches my stuff because you have to. Everybody else is going to play the strong stuff. You know, they have a system in place that, 
like it kind of like rates your commander and then it puts up commanders versus each other but it's it's bullocks i mean it's kind of they'd have to code a pretty complex ai so i'm not i'm not like saying they did anything wrong but you'd have to code a complex ai and give like each card in the game a number value or some sort of value to where like an ai reads every single card in the list and it's like hmm well this list has mostly s tier cards so these two lists should fight each other you know they don't have that type of system their system is like it looks at the commander and it's like well that's a pretty good commander it should go up against pretty good cards or other pretty good commanders but it's more so that you end up with uh a situation where it's like you know just reading off a commander so some people like you can juke the list in this game like i'll just tell you you can juke the system in this game it's not super absolute but you can definitely do it where it's like you put you play like a weaker commander and then you just play a bunch of really good cards in the deck but you play a weaker commander they've kind of fixed it somewhat it's not as bad as it used to be you definitely used to be able to juke it hardcore so see they're really going off at this list their ar list she's a really good uh mono colored commander honestly out of like a lot of the mono colored commanders ar is probably like one of the better ones honestly she really is she's really really good so they go ahead and opt to draw a card here remember our uh lisa Grand archangel exiles their creatures instead of going to the graveyard so and that means that when they they activate effects that say if it would die they don't activate at all because they got exiled they eaten alive here our campbell he's putting in work for us because he counts every non-creature spell and he's like taxing them basically for uh two by draining them for two he can get pretty crazy He's definitely like an old school commander. Like you've, you've heard about him for a while because he's been around for a while. Like I said, we do lose this one. As you can see, they went super duper wide. And that Bitter Blossom really started accruing up a, bo a boatload of value. Because we got a few other cards like that, like Dreadhorde Invasion. Where it's like it drains you for one and gives you a creature. White one's got, White's got one too. Makes Phyrexian Might tokens that can't block, but they uh, have Toxic 1. So, thing is with Dreadhorde Invasion, though, is it only gives you one guy. And going wide is almost always better than going tall. Going tall is what you call it when you just make, like, one creature huge. And it's just, like, big and can fight an entire army by itself. But that's usually not as good in Magic as versus going wide. You almost always want to go wide versus going tall. Like right here, we're, we're already finished anyways. Because the persist is going to bring them back. They only need to play like one more creature. So, and I'm pretty sure they do it right here. Like I said, this one's a loss. So I'll definitely play her sometime. Good game. Well played. <laughs> Now more than ever, the Grinch needs your support to steal Christmas. So by all means, click the buttons and thank you and have a wonderful day.